Dice Tower Tonight, episode 82. Room and boards. I like it. Welcome to Dice Tower Tonight, a video cast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On tonight's show, I'm planning a game room, and I'm looking to Crystal for some advice. We'll talk shelves, tables, lights, and more, and the chat can share their tips as well. Also, I bring back a silly favorite for Crystal and the chat to play. We run through some titles we've played lately, and we answer questions from the audience live. I'm Eric Summerer, and joining me now, the Kelly to my handy Manny, it's Crystal Dax. <laughs> okay, I don't know who Kelly or Handy Manny are. <laughs> well, Handy Manny is, uh, is a children's television show about uh, a character who runs a fix-it shop, and he's got a bunch of animated uh, tools and stuff. Kelly runs the uh, the hardware store, and she always has everything that handy manny needs for whatever situation he finds himself in so i well, thought it was apt okay i i feel better not having known that just based on the fact that it's a children's show <laughs> sure my kids were really into it for for a little while they were watching lots of episodes of handy manny very cool crystal how are you you know i'm doing pretty good honestly uh We've officially transitioned from summer into winter here in Las Vegas. There's very little room between those two things. And uh, so it has gotten pretty cold here. And of course, cold being relative compared to other places I know. But like, it's cold for people who live in the desert <laughs> right had, now. It's been very strangely warm up here in New England for the past several days. It, it was rainy and looked gloomy today, but it was like a warm rain. Oh, which okay. is very strange. Um, but we had, I think, like seven, mid-70s, even 80 uh, earlier wow. this week. So it's been gorgeous, and I'd be happy if it stayed that way for just a little bit longer. But I know it's coming. Um, all the leaves are falling like mad. So it's. Uh, I'm hoping we move before we really need to rake them. I'm not sure yeah. that's going to work. I think that should definitely be everybody's plan is when the leaves get so bad, you just move out and let just the next move out. to deal with them. Yeah. You know, I'd really rather rake the leaves at this point. It, oh. it would be easier than, than actually getting everything out of the house. Well, speaking of you moving, that's happening soon, isn't it? Yes. Next week. Next week, we are out of here. Um, I just finished my last book here in the studio. I'm waiting on a couple of pickups and small jobs and organization and stuff before I totally dismantle everything. But soon all this equipment is getting packed up and put in a bin as well as everything else in the house. Um, and, and we're out of here and it's, it's a little scary and the, the panic level is rising, but we're going to get there. I mean, we have I think, to yeah, at some it's, point. It's just going to happen and you'll be fine and it'll be stressful. And <sighs> then the stress will end. <laughs> yes. I envy you having moved into your house and I'm sure everything is unpacked and exactly where you want it to be right now. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, definitely I'm the type of person that promptly does all of those things, I say, as I look over at cardboard <laughs> boxes. Uh, no, like, I've been here five weeks now, and admittedly, almost everything is unpacked at this point. There are some boxes of games that I plan on selling that are in the garage that are just staying there because I'm not selling them right now, and... There's no reason to unbox them. Okay. Um, some of my art supplies are still boxed. And then I've actually been ordering furniture slowly. And I have some furniture that has arrived that I haven't taken out of their boxes to assemble. I think I'm actually going to hire somebody to come in and maybe put together all of it. Because it, like one individual piece of furniture, generally, I can put together on my own. Sure. You know, like it's not that bad. But I, it all, A, it takes me a lot longer than, I'd say, a handyman who's good with such things. And B, I have, like, a full-size dresser, a, like, sh a stand for the entryway that, like, will hold coats and shoes and things like that. Um, I have an end table for the living room that's fancy that actually, like, rotates, that spins, that has lots of compartments. So I have a feeling that if I tried to put all those things together, it would be frustrating and take a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. So, so they're just sitting in boxes for now. <laughs> I bought this furniture and I'm not using it because I can't, I don't want to assemble it. Uh, it's fine. I'm slowly working my way through everything. And, you know, about five years from now, I'll probably finish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that it doesn't take us that long. Uh, yeah. We've already sort of talked about with the kids, what, what's our priority and what rooms to get ready. Um, but one of those uh, that, that, 
sadly is not going to be first on the list is a game room and we're going to be talking about uh, what I am hopefully going to be doing with that space in the new house a little bit later in the show but first we we uh, want to plug a couple of things because you and oh, I yeah. have been uh, have been appearing in the various interwebs in various ways outside of our our normal spheres. Um, my top 100 has been going on uh, for the past several weeks. I think one was just posted today. Uh, I think it was episode seven. We're getting very close to uh, to the final approach to the, to the f- top ten and number one. Who? What could it be? Um, and. <laughs> And it's been a lot of fun seeing people's reactions to those, and I'm glad they're enjoying those. So, you know, now that YouTube is back up, you can go check out those after you're done with Dice Tower tonight. And Crystal, you made another podcast appearance recently, right? I did. I um, I was honored to be asked to be a guest on the Breaking Into Board Games podcast, where um, the hosts are a board game designer, developer, and publisher. And so they look at the board game industry kind of from that side of things, but they interview people within the board game industry just about their experiences in the industry. And so I got to talk to them about how I got into content creation and how my content creation career, for lack of a better word, has evolved over time. And it was really interesting. Um, And I think we touched on some really cool stuff. And I got to reiterate some stories that I hadn't told in a while, um, since I've been doing this for quite a few years now. It was, uh, and somebody actually pointed out on Twitter that it was a nice compliment to my recent appearance on the Pointless Parrot podcast, because Pointless Parrot was almost entirely about my personal life. And breaking into board games was almost entirely about my life as a board game content creator. And okay. so there wasn't a lot of crossover in the discussions, even though the, the episodes released near one another. So that was kind of neat. It's a, a neat uh, sort of bookends of, of who is Crystal. Yeah. yeah. And, and who Crystal is is evolving on a daily basis. So <laughs> it was nice to kind of have a, a little uh, touch point yeah. <laughs> right now. Nice. Uh, well, another thing that, that Crystal's been doing is playing games, and you've got one to talk about. I'd love to hear it. I do. I, um, the people over at Bluefish Games kindly sent me a copy of The Curious Elevator of Mr. Hinks. Mm-hmm. So uh, Ambi actually got a review copy of this from them and then talked about it on uh, the Board Game Blitz podcast. And I, as she was describing it, was like, oh, man, like that sounds really fun. Because we generally... We try not to specifically solicit multiple review copies of games. Just because Ambi and I are geographically apart, we don't want to take advantage of a publisher's generosity. So often, if, if somebody gives, offers us a, a review copy, either she'll take it or I'll take it. Right. Um, but after the episode aired, Bluefish reached out and they said, well, well do you want to try it too? And I said, yes, please. <laughs> So The Curious Elevator of Mr. Hanks is uh, similar in vain to escape room podcasts like Exit or Unlock. Um, It is puzzly, uh, like all of those games. And I'm actually going to show you some of the components. I will say I will not spoil anything. So anything that I show on camera will be things that you would see immediately upon opening the box. So there are no spoilers here. The premise of this game is that um, Mr. Hanks has set up this elaborate set of puzzles for you based on an elevator. And you go to different levels on the elevator and solve puzzles and then have to enter a code to go to the next level. Um, And so this game utilizes a website. It is not entirely in the box. And the website is a big part of the game because each level of the elevator is depicted on screen. And there are some audio clues that occur during the game as well. Um, they do have uh, sub- or captions for those audio clues though, which is nice if you aren't able to necessarily listen. Um, but the coolest thing about this game especially in comparison to some of the other escape room games that I really love is the components in this game feel more genuine than the stuff you get in say unlock or exit. And I love both exit and unlock. I am, those series are wonderful, but in exit and unlock, you don't get a component with an actual wax seal on it. Yeah. You don't get postcards that feel like postcards. Yeah. You don't get ads and business cards and coupons 
<laughs> that look and feel like ads, business cards, and coupons. Yep. Like, all of the components in this game. Oh, like this one. Okay, this literally, it's just like stock information from a company. And it's on that printer paper that has the perforated sides, like that old school printer paper. And it's like legit. Like they, the amount of care that went into the components of this game yeah. is evident. Um, and I think that's one of the neatest things about it. But the other neat thing about this game is the puzzles feel different than the puzzles in Exit and Unlock or other more common or more, uh, I would say, more popular escape room games at this point. I don't know how well known this one is, um, but it should be more well known, <laughs> basically. Um, I did fairly well with it. The hint system that they have online is also really, really robust. Um, and there's no time limit or penalties of any kind. They just yeah. want to say, play the game. Once you get done with it, you get to put your name on the Hall of Fame leaderboard, and that's it. And the hints are nice because they have a lot of hints for every level of the elevator, and they work in the way your brain would work, basically. Like, the first hint is always, what are the components needed to solve this puzzle? Yep. At least right from the get-go. And then beyond that, it's, did you look at this? What if you did that? Okay, now we'll tell you the thing. And then so on and so forth. So it's really nice because in the times that I did feel a little stuck, it was often, you know how that feeling when you're trying to solve a puzzle and you know how to solve it, but you can't do it somehow? Like, I know that this is necessary and it relates to that thing, but your brain just isn't making the final little connection. That happened to me a couple times playing this. And I was very easily able to click through like, okay, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Yeah. And get to the one tiny bit that my brain wasn't doing um, and solve the puzzle that way. Um, so the hints were great. It was super fun. I did play it by myself, you know, pandemic times yep. and all of that. Uh, but I think it was a really good solo experience. It says on the box, I believe one to four people, but I don't, the experience doesn't change based on the number of players. And honestly, I think it was great as a solo experience. Um, I think this would also be fun for a couple. Um, yeah. None of the content was adult in nature, so no. you could play this with kids. Um, and I would say the only thing that AMB pointed out during the podcast that I noticed as well is um, this is the mildest of spoilers, but it's a thing that would be very obvious upon playing the game, so it's not actually like a solvable spoiler, um, is... So a lot of the puzzles in this game rely on anagrams, so jumbled up words. And so if okay. you are not a fan of anagrams or if you're bad at them, um, some of the puzzles could be frustrating for that reason. Um, and I could, thought I was good at anagrams, but apparently. There were a couple <laughs> words in here that they stumped me. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, The Curious Elevator of Mr. Hanks. I honestly, it's available from their website. If you look up Bluefish Games, or I think it's actually, if you Hinks go to- dot com. Yep, that's it, Hinks. And Hinks is spelled H-I-N-C-K-S, Hinks. Um, if you go to their website, I'm not, let's actually yeah. hold it in front of the camera. <laughs> um, you can buy it directly from them. And I would highly recommend this. If you like escape room or puzzle style games, this is a really fun one. Yep. I think you have uh, must have the second printing. Uh, the the version I had was in like a plain brown cardboard box with the printing on it, but yours oh, looks okay. a little, just a little bit nicer. Um, yeah, it's a little bit fancy. It I I adore. I I agree with just about everything you said. Uh, the hint system is really nice. It's a very gentle progression of hints. I really like the way they did that. Um, in fact, they were bragging about it when they asked me if I wanted to play it. They said, "We think we really like our hint system. We think you'll like it too." And I absolutely did. Um, you know there is another adventure in the same vein, correct? The, the curious stairs. stairs of Mr. Hanks. It's a little smaller. It's not quite as big. It's actually a, literally a smaller box. Um, so it's a little quicker. But along the same lines of the varying components, I just love how many different... I think there's a pencil in there. There's pieces made of plastic. There's lots of paper craft. There's just delightful different ways to use the materials and as you said more varied than something that's produced by a board game manufacturer that's going to stick pretty much with cardstock and cardboard and you know those materials um so it's it's kind of cool it's very it's very um it's like surprising when you open up the box and see all the stuff inside 
it's pretty neat. Yeah, it just, it feels... I mean, no escape room ever feels 100% genuine. Like, in a, even in a real escape room, in a physical room, you know that you're in an escape room. You don't yeah. actually think you're trapped in a dungeon, handcuffed to the wall or whatever. Like, you know, that never... And this, as far as at-home experiences go, this is one of the most authentic feeling that I have uh, encountered. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, for me, I got to play Athenium Mystic Library from uh, Renegade Games. The It's a design studio that, that put this together that I hadn't heard of before. L'Atelier. A, a French okay. design studio. Can, I, can you see it right there? L'Atelier. Um, I love the cover image. That's just really striking. The, the that theme is, nice. is, is that you are um, working in a mystical library, a like a wizard's library, as uh, an assistant in the library. And, well, it says that you're a student there. There's nothing about being a student in this game at all. It's all about reshelving the books. Um, you are given a shelf. Uh, everybody gets one with different compartments, and you can't quite see it on the webcam, but they're divided into places for books. So this one just has a, a row of them. That's only one one layer of books. But this one has two layers of books that have to go up on each other. And you're going to be placing books into these frames. Um, and you have to build them in a certain way. You have to have a book with support. You can't just put a book just floating in the middle of space. And you can't put it where it's going to fall over. You have to put it where it's going to be next to a wall or next to another book. And supported by a book below it if you're going to build multiple layers up. The way this happens is these drafting action cards because uh, the main mechanism is a draft everybody gets i think it's six six cards in a round uh you will choose one and pass your remaining hand to the next player and do that five times and discard the remaining card you do that twice and that's the whole game so 10 actions the whole game the cards are divided into three sections um the bottom is what you get and so this says i would get two pink books there's five different colors of books um but then the player to this side is going to get this benefit. And the player to this side is going to get this benefit. So you get to do three things between your card and your two neighbors on a turn. And you can trigger them in whatever order. Sometimes it's um, books that have to go in a specific spot on your shelf. Sometimes it's random books. Sometimes you get to draw bonus tiles from a bag, which could give you additional actions or more scoring opportunities, stuff like that. Um, and you're trying to fulfill basically these orders. You know, get these books into this pattern and you're going to score seven points. But this one has to be in this section of the of the bookshelf. Or um, have any book in those positions on the shelf. As long as those spots are filled, six points. Um, but there's also an economy there because you... You have magic wands that you use to claim these orders, and you have to take actions to get more of those wands to be able to score more orders as the game goes on. Um, components are pretty solid. I got to give them lots of style credit here. They give you these trays Ooh. with the books inside. Okay, um, that's nice. And they're these lovely little, you know, books, and they have whimsical titles like My Date with Bigfoot. Whoops, I just dropped that one. <laughs> Um, what is this one? Um, I, I had one. They're, they're being very difficult on me. This one is Dungeon Culinary Arts. <laughs> or The Power of Negative Thinking. There's tons of little books in, in here. And this nice tray is cool. Although... It looks great on the table, but if you then put it in the box and put the box on its side, it's going to fall everywhere. So I have Ooh. to I have to bag all of the books to go in the little cells. Not yeah. A deal. yeah, that's um, not a huge deal. And this continues for 10 rounds, and you score points for filling up entire shelves and for putting candles on the top of the shelf. You can get shelf extenders to, to put more books. So, like, more, more books. Um... It was neat. I uh, my my kids, actually, my elder child understood it just fine. My younger child basically started playing randomly, and gleefully so. He just like eeny meeny miny mo works every time, and he just play a card. 
but he had fun just putting all the pink books together, all the blue books together, all the purple books okay. together. Um, it didn't score him enough points to win. Um, but my 12 year old, I just beat him in the tiebreaker. He was neck oh, wow. and neck with me the whole time. So it certainly is something that, that a, a family weight game that everybody could understand. Um, it's a puzzly game because you're trying to figure You can move books around with actions and try and get them into positions to fulfill those orders. Um, it's neat. You know, how do I get these patterns to show up with the actions I have? That's a really theme. interesting. Yeah. Like so it. Ex Libris is also published by Renegade Games, isn't it? It is. And I saw a thread by the designer of Ex Libris because I think when this first showed up, um, there was a lot of similarities in because Ex Libris also has whimsical titles. Uh, Ex Libris has you having to alphabetize the the titles. It's much more about the specific titles being in a particular position. This is more about creating color patterns and positional patterns. Um, they're, they're sort of different. And it, I think, I don't think Ex Libris has this drafting mechanism that, no. that Athenium does. Um, they're both lovely themes, although similar, uh, but they're very different games. Okay. I will. And I, I own and really like um, a game from weird giraffe games called Fire in the Library. So that means I know of at least three library themed games. And I think that's pretty cool because as a theme, that's a really interesting one. Uh, so, you know, we're just moving toward the top 10 library themed games list that will come out from the Dice Tower in 2028, <laughs> I will say. That's, <laughs> you, you've, commi you've said it. It's now got to happen. I mean, a library is like a lovely place. And I, I like Fire in the Library, especially because you're trying to save books from a burning yes. library. And that's a fun theme. Yep. And it's a good push your luck game. I mean, so. this one certainly stood out for me as, as an interesting theme. And it, it looked like it would be something that, that I'd connect with. And I, I think I agree. I think this one's going to stick around for a little while. Very cool. So it's time to play a game, Crystal. Well, that sounds like a really fun plan. Yes, indeed. Uh, so this was one, I, I it's, as we said, uh, I think before you asked me how things were going and I answered chaos. <laughs> um, so I didn't have time to plan too much. So I turned, as we will sometimes do when things get wacky, uh, to one of our favorites. And this is a new favorite. We're going to play another round of Trivia Trolls. Yay! <laughs> uh, we played this a few weeks ago. In fact, I should probably say who's the publisher of this is. Where where did they go? Is it? It may actually be like Trivia Trolls Trolls LLC, which I think that might have been what it was when you looked before. I'm not sure. That is literally what it is. Trivia Trolls LLC. It is a party game uh, in which you're going to answer questions, trivia questions, um, and there are three levels of clues: one, two, and three point clues, and the other team has a set of cards, a hand of cards that they can play to mess you up, uh, to hinder your ability to answer the question. And um, so there's a little bit of strategy as to when you play those cards and, and this uh, sort of head-to-head -head situation. Here on Dice Tower tonight, we're playing this as a cooperative game. I am in charge of reading the clues. Crystal is in charge of officially answering the answers, but she can get help from the chat. So chat, you are perfectly welcome to Type whatever you'd like into the chat and help her out. Um, of course, it's up to Crystal whether she looks at the chat or not. Um, we didn't. I'm not going to put any limits on it. This is all just about us cooperatively getting to the goal. The problem, okay. of course, is that after Crystal decides what level of clue she's going to go for, I'm going to read. I have seven questions, one of each of the seven categories of, of possible question. Once she decides what level of clue she's going to go for, I will pull a troll, which is going to be some hindrance toward me answering or giving her the clue. Uh, I did, because we had such fun a couple weeks ago, I did pull out all the trolls that we already did. So this should be oh, all nice. new ones. Okay. Uh, also, we don't have any. I, I sort of handpicked the, uh, the clues so that I think you will know some of them. I guess we'll find out. Well, in that case, I will definitely hide the chat for now, and I will only go to the chat if I need to. There you go. So, I mean, chat, could... make sure you're helping me out, even if I'm not looking at it right away. We could say you have, I don't know, three chances to look at the chat. I like it. That Why sounds not? pretty good. Uh, the goal is to get to 11 points. Uh, that would That's as high as the scoreboard goes, so we're going to call that a win if we manage to get there. Okay. So, your first category, Crystal, is sports. 
Would you like to go for the one point, the two point, or the three point clue? I, so, I always hate the whole, like, stigma about, like, girls don't know sports. I do know things about sports, and I enjoy sports. I don't know But when it comes to trivia about sports, that's where I tend to not. So we're going to go for the one point clue, the simplest, the easiest. The one point clue. Okay. The troll is... The player reading the clue must read the clue without every word containing the letter S. <laughs> Okie dokie. Okie dokie. <clears throat> Your clue. Let me. Okay, just looking ahead. I yeah, can't yeah. say that. I can't say that. I can't say that. Uh, this is going to go well. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Named after the chewing gum, Field is home to the Chicago organization. Wrigley! Wrigley Field is right! See? Yeah! You know sports! I do! I know some things. That was easy. Thank goodness for chewing gum not having S's in it. <laughs> See? Sometimes you luck out. All right. Well, you're on a roll. Now we can go for more points. Obviously. Your next category is entertainment. One, two, or three points. Let's go for seven. So we need to get at least three two-point clues. Let's go for two. Two points. And chat is is right behind you. They all are saying, Wrigley, Wrigley, Wrigley. Two points for entertainment. The troll is. I feel, This is like the, the password announcer. The password <laughs> is. The troll is. The player reading the clue must do so while flapping their finger up and down across their lips. Oh, gosh! <clears throat> this animated cartoon character has shared a scene with his Disney counterpart, Donald Duck, in a piano duel. I mean, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna say this is my official answer, but it, like it feels like it would have to be Daffy Duck, but like his Disney counterpart. I don't actually know that Donald Duck and Daffy Duck are counterparts, so to speak. One is Looney Tunes, one is Disney. Uh, I'm gonna say that that's most likely my. No, no, no. I only get three chances to look at the chat, so <laughs> I'm gonna say Daffy Duck. Daffy Duck is right. Yes. Okay. This animated cartoon character has shared a scene with his Disney counterpart, Donald Duck, in a piano duel. I believe that was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh. Which was a breaking of the walls. That was like the first time Looney Tunes and Disney characters appeared together. I don't didn't remember that there were Disney characters in that movie. Ooh, I knew it. There, huh. It's been a long time since I've seen that movie. All I remember is Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly. She did make an impression. Yeah, huh? Your next category is pop culture. One, two, or... I didn't give you your two points. There you go. You're up to three. Okay. okay. One, two, so or three. We'll, I, I feel like I'm good at pop culture. I'm going to say three points. We'll see what happens. Three points it is. And the troll is. The player reading the clue must mouth the clue without making a sound. Oh, Not gosh, even a whisper. I'm s- okay, I'm so bad at lip reading. Hold on. Right, I'm going to well, make Skype really big. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to get a little closer just so. Oh, I, I cannot lip read. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. Are we ready? I mean, as ready as I'm going to be. I'm just going to keep staring. (laughs) The first something was something that resembles banana, but probably not banana. Uh, dang it. I mean, on the plus side, it probably wouldn't have mattered if it was the one, two, or three point clue, because with this, uh, can we, can we get the mouthing one more time, Eric? All right. Are we allowed to do that? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, here we go. I, I literally, like, if you ask my coworker, Matt, who sits right across from me, like, he tends to talk quietly, and I, like, bother him all the time, because I'm just like, I can't hear you, and I can't read lips, so just, you have to, 
I, honest to God, I'm going to look at the chat. I'm going to see if they figured out anything. This will be one of my three chat uses. Yep. Uh, I don't think you're okay, going to get much. <laughs> okay, well, the first of was, <laughs> nope, nope, I got nothing fairy tale. I'm out. Ends with 2003. First example of this, Famous Dance, 2003. Ooh. Okay. So, like, I was a senior in high school. What dance was in 2003? Macarena was way earlier. When did the cha-cha slide came out? Because that was around when I was in college. 2003, 2003. Soldier Boy was after that. <sighs> <laughs> I'm going to say... This isn't bad for chat to be working on together. This is a good crowdsourced question. Yeah, this is a good crowdsourced one. I, I'm going to just say the cha-cha slide <laughs> and hope <clears throat> that that... Cha-cha slide is incorrect. Uh, I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to read the clue. This was a okay. tricky one, um, even okay. even with with audio. The first attempt of this viral dance was unsuccessful in Manhattan in 2003. First attempt at, the, at a viral dance? Harlem Shake? No, that was later. That was way later. Viral dance in Manhattan? Oh, so it could have been an older dance, but how would it fail? I don't. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say the hokey pokey just because it's funny to say. Flash mob. Oh, okay. So they weren't looking for a dance. They were, oh, I see, I so see. So some of the other clues, this viral dance is commonly used in marriage proposals. That's or... weird because viral dance and flash mob to me seem like Two different things, not a description of the other. All right, I'm, I don't feel bad for missing that. Okay, I, I'm, I don't want you to feel bad. We have, <laughs> we have four questions left to go. This is the mystery category. This can be anything, anything oh, at gosh. all. One, two, okay. or three points, Crystal. Well, we we're gonna go for two. Two points. The troll is. The player reading the clue must read the clue without the last letter of each word. Oh, the sure be interesting. Okay, well, I, I got <clears throat> this should be interesting, okay. but somehow I feel like that won't continue. The executive order issue be President Lincoln o September 22nd, 1860. Change Liga Statu or three point Milio American to Fre So it's when Lincoln freed the slaves via an executive order. And this is the thing that, like, I'm going to sound stupid if I'm wrong, because history and I, I know it's a very obvious thing, chat. Don't, just don't judge me. Is it, it but the name, because there's different, uh, is it the Emancipation Proclamation? It is the Emancipation okay, Proclamation. <laughs> I'm just doubting myself, because it's one of those things where you're like, that's clearly the right answer. And then you say it out loud and everybody's like, no, that's clearly the wrong answer. You definitely got it. Uh, the, the number one answer, the, the one pointer this document's name is two words that rhyme, and the document okay. declared all slaves shall be free. Okay. That. I'm going to turn on chat and see. Oh, yeah, everybody in the chat it, yeah. knew it. <laughs> uh, board game fangirl, this is called Trivia Trolls that we're playing right now. Geography is your question. One, two, or three points. You currently have five points out of the 11, and there's three questions left to go. So we have to do at least two. I'm bad at geography, so we're going to go for two. Two points. The troll is. The player reading the clue must replace every letter E with the letter X. May the odds books experts in the your favor. Yeah, this is going to go well. <clears throat> the letter E, huh? Okay. Yeah, uh, it's not like any countries or cities have E's in their names. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. This is the northern most Gruxit lakes and is 
bordix or by both thux unitexd stext and Canada. Northernmost lake bordered by the United States and Canada. So I know that the Great Lakes around Michigan uh, definitely border both countries. There's at least a couple of them that fall within that vicinity. Um, like the border is really close to <clears throat> Detroit, if I remember correctly. But the geographical locations of the lakes, I am very not certain of. There's Erie, Huron, Superior, Michigan, and something else. Well, we're going to go to the chat and see what the chat is saying. Might be a good idea. Uh, all right. They, I would not have, I would have been taking a shot in the dark. They say superior, so I'm going with superior. I feel good at least that I named it before I looked at the chat. Superior is the correct answer. It's the northernmost and the largest of the Great Lakes. So you it is superior to all of the other Great Lakes. <laughs> yes, indeed. I think superior for position, not necessarily for size, but yeah. either way, you're right. You and the chat are correct. Yay. Thanks, chat. I needed the assist there. Although, I, uh, well, so what's the fifth one? What's the one I'm missing? Uh, oh, Ontario. Ah, uh, there you go. They, okay. It spells out homes, if you, uh, that, I'm, oh, a Mich yeah. I'm a Michigander, grew up in Kalamazoo, so that's definitely... I, I have uh, relatives in Farmington Hills, and I've been through Kalamazoo, so. History is your next category. Oh, you have gosh. two questions left. You uh, need one, two, three, four more points in order to win. So it's I have to get them both right no matter what. Yes. History is one that I am also, <laughs> am I bad at everything? I think so. <laughs> Other than like pop culture and entertainment, I'm kind of bad at everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one for history and just hope that the last category is one that I'm stronger in. Okay, you're just hoping to finish strong. I All mean, right. I have to answer both correctly, so I want to give myself the best shot at history. I like then it. We'll, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the troll is. The player reading the clue must read it in their best British accent. Hmm. Well, that should be easy. In theory... <clears throat> History. This man was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1940 to 1945 and led the country to victory in the Second World War. I mean, that was strangely apt for that question. Like, the troll fit way too well. I did I not like stack that. the deck. I do not know many British Prime Ministers. Based exclusively on references that I've seen in the television show Doctor Who. Like, how long was... Winston Churchill was around for much more than five years, wasn't he? I don't know, but he's one of the only ones I know of that was from a long time ago. So I'm just... Because oh. if I look at the chat, then I don't get to look at the chat for the 3.1. But if I get this wrong, then it's all for naught. So I'm going to look at the chat. Ooh. I know. Oh, dang it, it is Churchill. <laughs> it is Churchill, yes. Doctor Who never lets me down. I should trust Doctor Who. <laughs> oh, goodness. I, I mean, because Second World War, like Doctor Who episodes definitely centered in that area. Like I knew, but I still, ugh, dang it. Daniel Heinz Bond says, so Eric's from London. It didn't say where I needed to be from. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm hiding S the chat. Final question. You have to go for the three points. It's yep. science. Are you going to blind me, Eric? Maybe. Maybe that's what the troll is. The <laughs> troll is. The player reading the clue must read it with a mouthful of water. Uh, I would say be careful around your equipment. <laughs> Oh, dear God. <laughs> A little less water. <laughs> Don't spit water on your equipment, Eric. <laughs> Waddle, 
forced to absorb the filtering of white light into the colors of the visible light spectrum through a prism. First person to observe the colors of light through a prism. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, even if I've deciphered that correctly, I don't think I know. It feels like it would be something that I would be able to suss out based on, like... I could give it to you one more time. I, d I mean, I don't know if that would help. <laughs> if you would really like to, you can. <laughs> this English scientist was the first to observe the filtering of white light into the colors of the visible light spectrum through a prism. Okay, so an English scientist that observed the filtering of white light into uh, through a prism into the, the rainbow, basically. English scientist. Yeah, you, it would help if I knew the nationality of scientists as well. <sighs> Uh, my eyes are watery. <clears throat> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, and I can't look at chat because I already did it three times. <laughs> I, I think I do have a new voice for audiobooks. Next time I have a fish person. Actually, I did have a fish person. I have a series in which I have a dryad character, but I can't do that every single time. So I just oh, yeah. ha I have to. What do I do? I think I talk like this. I think I have him talking like this all the time. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's adorable, is what that is. Oh, who observes light through a prism? Chat English. is uh, has guessed, and and many are getting it correct. So of course they are. I, I'm. You're not allowed to look at them. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, Coralou says Crystal should have trusted her gut on the last one and saved Chat for this one. Oh, that's so true. I would win. Okay, so I just have to name a random scientist. Yes, Kabuki. Dryads. It was not dryads. It's naiad. That's what I'm. I was mm. thinking of. He is a naiad. English scientist. I don't know people's nationalities. Just gonna have to take a stab in the dark, I guess. All right. Maybe it'll fall from the sky. I don't. <laughs> Newton. What? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> kind <laughs> you seem I'm so honestly, sad i had I... no idea like i i know about the gravity stuff in newton i did had no idea he was the first to observe that uh, the light through a prism thing so that honestly that's cool because i learned something new today uh yes definitely chat chat had it um and as jerry says they're not really rules they're more guidelines yeah, right? I know, but it just also doesn't feel as satisfying to click over to the chat and just read the correct answer to win the game. That's true. Uh, where, whereas your mild help was felt a little more satisfying. Warren says he treated her to a clue. He... Anyway, that was Trivia Trolls. Good time. You really are the apple of my eye. Oh, Eric. thank you. So... <laughs> That was that that actually went a little longer than I expected. We should get to our discussion because I need your advice, Crystal. As we've said, I am moving next week. Uh, at the end of the week, we're out of here. Uh, we're moving about an hour away to a new house, a bigger house, and one that has a potential game room. This is a formal living room that is 12 feet by 23 feet. Oh, wow. It has a nice big window in the front, um, some heat, heating grates, uh, like radiator heat, on two of the small walls. But the one long wall is just pristine open space for shelves. And it's going to be the game room, and I can't wait. And I've been researching possibilities for the past several weeks when I really should be packing. Um... And, and I want to sort of break it down and figure out what maybe you've done or you have thought about doing in your new house and, and what you think and what the chat thinks about, uh, about how to approach a gaming space. So the first thing and the primary reason, one of the reasons why we were looking for a larger house is the storage of the games that, as I've quipped before, 
we ran out of room a long time ago for the dedicated game space. So how, yes, as Coralou has already said, <laughs> five by five Kallaxes all the way. The Kallax seems to be, and this is from Ikea, one of Ikea's shelves, the the board gamer standard right now. A lot of people buy the, the Kallaxes and they stick them in, the, in those nice cells. Um, they're six feet wide, so I would be able to fit three of them on that wall. And that would be a lot of, of gaming space. And that was the plan until I happened to catch Scott Nicholson, uh, Board Games with Scott, a few years ago did a side-by-side -side comparison. He actually bought a Calyx unit, he bought a Besta unit, and he bought a Billy unit of all the same widths and put the same amount of games in each one and figured out how they fit. And so it's like... It's the, the closest thing to a side-by-side -side comparison I had seen. Um, and the problem with the Calyx is that depending on what size games you're putting in there, you end up with a lot of empty space. So you'll fill in one of these cells, and then there's like a, a half an inch. And I already that already drove me nuts in the shelves I did have, um, where you you know fill something up, and then you've got this much space. I could stick a book in there, but I'm not going to stick a game in there. And then if I don't fill that space, then the the games that are up there start to open up and spill out. And uh, ugh, I don't want that. So th I'm sort of leaning toward the Besta right now, which okay. come in two foot chunks, which will allow me to put more of them into that space because I'm not having to stick to a six foot width. Um, and it would let me... And it would let me sort of customize it a little more. You can adjust the shelves and change the heights, and I could be more specific about how I organize the space. Um, and so, yeah, best of both worlds, says Kabuki. Well done. <laughs> that would be the best of both worlds. So that's kind of where I'm headed. Um, what What are your thoughts on, on shelves for your games? So I currently own a 5x5 five five Kallax. Um, and, and what's interesting is in the old house, um, my game room, we, our house had a really unique layout. You would come into the entryway and then immediately walk into this giant open space that spanned the entire two stories of the house. Like, like it was completely open all the way up to the roof, uh, two stories tall. And that was essentially the like, family room space and then it jutted off into a single story dining room but that was also part of the same room um but the hallway on the upper level was above the dining room um again all open though so like you could see the hallway upstairs everything was open in that giant room so for our game space there a lighting was the worst because all of the lights were two stories above and even if I put lamps in that room, I could never light it well. Um, and it just, it didn't feel cozy. And so like we shoved my Kallax against the wall near where the game table was, but it never felt like good. Here in this house, um, I have turned what would be most people's dining room into my game room. Um, I don't use a formal dining room pretty much ever anyway. And honestly, um, and I uh, backed the Wormwood Kickstarter for their game table um, that they just ran here within the past few months. <laughs> I think it just ended like a month or two ago now. Um, and I did get toppers for my table that I ordered. And so it can serve as a dining table as well. It won't come until July or August, but when it arrives, that'll be perfect. Right now I have my folding poker table um, that I already owned in the, the room. But what's neat is the wall along the side of my room. Uh, I have my one Kallax in there, but that's only about two thirds of my board game collection. The rest are still in boxes because I don't have a place to put them. Um, and so I think what I might end up doing just because of how well it'll fit in the space, I might just buy another five by five Kallax because I believe the two of them will literally just like span that entire wall about perfectly. And since I already have one, it kind of makes sense. But like, I totally get what you're saying about that little extra space that you're like, and you're like, oh, can I fit this in here? No. And it's just a little bit too small for most things. Um, I think if you finagled your games around very specifically, you could probably yeah. make it work, but then you don't have any specific organization to them. And I do tend to organize my games a little bit, um, <clears throat> although I change my mind all the time. 
my general organization is games that I want to play more often on the top, games that I don't want to play as often on the bottom. <laughs> I think I'm totally going to be going by size because I, I plan to, you know, get make a shelf, get up, get a shelf set up so that games of this height will fit just fit on this shelf and do a row of those and then move to the next shelf and pick a different height. So there might be a whole chunk of Ticket to Ride size and then a chunk of, of other sizes. And, and I want to try and get them that lets them fit as best as possible uh, if, if I can manage to arrange them that way. So you touched on two of the other things I wanted to talk about. And um, I just saw one of them, Ben, in the chat says, lighting is one element I'm concerned about. Um, having lights overhead putting glare on the game, trying to figure out how to create indirect lighting. Um, lighting is something that I am going to have to figure out because there isn't as many formal living rooms uh, at the time this house was built in the 80s did. It doesn't have built-in overhead lighting. It was made to have a... Uh, um, you know, lamps, reading lamps and that sort of thing to, to set a mood, I guess. Um, but the mood I want is being able to see my games. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to figure, you know, there's there's ways you can, you could try and wire something. I, I don't necessarily want to hire an electrician to wire something right off the bat. Um, you can attach things to the ceiling. You can go with like light panels that Velcro to the wall. Um, or when I was growing up, we had a lamp that was near our couch that, you know, was anchored over here, but then it stretched way up over and then it had lamps that sort of hung over the couch. Something that design might be cool that gets out of our way, but can sort of spread the light around the table. Um, but, but what our friend in the chat was talking about, getting that glare might be something oh. that I am worried about. Yeah. You definitely want the lighting to be bright but diffuse because if it's too harsh, then yeah, you're going to end up with glare on stuff from some angle or another. So even if it's not glare on your side of the table, it might be for your friend across the table. Yep. And that can be really annoying, especially if you're trying to look at components farther down on the table. Like if you're looking at your own player board, tilt it a little bit, whatever, you're fine. But like, oh, I can't see that part of the board over there now because the light yeah. is too. So I think generally you want to have multiple light sources from multiple directions and have it be diffused in some way. But like, it's funny because light diffusal isn't something that most people are thinking about when they're lighting their house because it doesn't, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't really matter. I mean, shoot, like a standard lamp, will this tilt over here? Or can I bring it? Like, like, <laughs> a standard lamp has, you know, something like this on it. Right. Whatever. But it doesn't really, like, all this light coming up here. And at least this one's going upward, so it's, but it still can create glare, if, depending on where you place it. Yeah. Um, James says there's simple track lighting that you can plug in, point the lights up at the ceiling, and then it's all indirect lighting. And that's actually a good point. Uh, indirect lighting, um, if you do have really bright lights, like a lamp that's super bright, um, that has multi-directional things that you can point. It's not actually a bad idea if the walls are a light color to point the lights directly at the wall and let the light bounce off of the wall to some degree. Now, obviously that's not gonna get you a ton of bright lighting all the time, but it can help diffuse the light if you don't have an other, another way to diffuse it. So yeah. um, that's, uh, that's an idea as well. Coralou is is saying just do it right the first time. Hire the electrician. It's going to be permanent. This is what you want. Do it right. So, eh, yeah, you have a point. Um, I'm still I mean, not sure about the the lighting's a big question mark right now. I'm not sure what I want yeah. to do yet. Well, and there is something to be said for having flexibility too, especially since you are going to have a large game room, like. If you have permanent lighting installed, I would imagine you're going to say, okay, the table's going to go here, the shelves are going to go here, so put the lights in this spot. But like, what if you get a different table later or decide right. to rotate or change things up? Then, in theory, that permanent lighting might be not as great anymore. I mean, it's still probably fine, but I, I do think, especially as you move in and you're just getting used to the feel of the house and the feel of your game room, it's not a bad idea to come up with some less permanent solutions and see how they work um, you know, because 
that will make things easier if you do decide to change things up. So a uh, third thing on my list was the table itself. You just, you said you, you went for the Kickstarter of a, uh, of a, a dedicated table. One of the really nice ones. This um, is the first time I've ever like actually got myself a real board game table. And I'm very excited about it. But for the record, I know that those are not affordable for everyone. Admittedly, Wormwood's Kickstarter was more affordable than a lot of others. But I will say the thing that I, the other thing I mentioned is what I have currently, which is a folding poker table. And it's oblong in shape. It seats 10 people with cup holders, has a padded rim around the outside and was not that expensive. And I think that it's something that a lot of board gamers don't even like think about is, you know, when you're shopping for tables, you don't necessarily think, oh, look for a poker table. But honestly, that table has served me really well with board gaming for a long time. The only downside to that specifically is um, its width is not big enough for a sum game. So like the board will take up um. a majority of the space and then the player boards kind of have to be off to the side. Yep. I mean, we've been able to make basically every game work on it aside from, I think, Star Trek Ascendancy. No go on that table. Yep. We have to have a square table for that one. Um, and there's probably a couple other really large ones that wouldn't work. But I think for people who are looking for a good board game table that is affordable, it's a, a poker table is a really good option to look into. Yes. Uh, the option that I do have right now is uh, a game topper. Um, so that is ready to go either on a folding table or getting an inexpensive wooden table. One that I don't really care what it looks like on top because I'm going to put a, a game topper on top of it. Um, and that will probably be what we do for for a while. Um, and then at some point get a dedicated gaming table, a more permanent solution, and use the game topper for putting on the other tables in the house when we do a big game day. Um, I like the portability of the game toppers, but it's not it's not the permanent solution that I eventually want to have in the room. Um, Jerry said... I like the Jasper, which is boardgametables.com. Board yeah. um, I, I actually went looking at what they had, and now all Facebook wants to show me is ads for <laughs> board game tables. <laughs> yep. I, I, I've considered board game tables and the Game Topper and a couple other different companies' Kickstarters um, in the past. I, I'm actually I'm kind of lucky because there was a board game Kickstarter that happened about a year or a year and a half ago, and I don't remember what company it was, but basically it went disappeared into the void. Um, and some friends of mine here in town actually backed it. Um, and I think if I remember from what they told me correctly, Wormwood actually offered the people from that Kickstarter like early access or like early backing tiers or something for their Kickstarter, even though they weren't related to the other company. Hmm. Um, I could be misspeaking a little bit because I'm not super familiar with what happened, but I almost backed that other Kickstarter and would have theoretically lost a bunch of money. Um, so I, Wormwood is, is a, has got a really good track record, and so I'm not as scared about fulfillment from them. If it gets delayed, like any theoretical Kickstarter could, that'll be fine. But I'm really excited to have a, like, a real wooden game table because I've just never had that before. Uh, one thing that uh, that came up from Daniel in the chat is, please invest in real chairs. Oh gosh, yes. Do not go for uh, the 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 cheap folding metal ones. We've got some probably the least expensive IKEA folding chairs you could ever imagine. Really thin metal and plastic things. Um, in fact, I don't know if it, it. Can you see it? If I if I go down here. That oh yeah, 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 yeah. Right there. We've got a whole set of those. Um those Which are not. When you very need a mess of seating, those come in handy. For a family game day, hooray, throw them everywhere. But right. I I do, you know, back in the, the, the geek chic days, um, they sold like they called it the eight hour chair. Um it was insanely expensive, but it was a very comfortable chair. Um and so, yeah, that's probably something I'm going to want to invest in. And and do I do this in chunks? Do I uh, start with a game topper and and then order a table and may, then maybe get the chairs to go with the game topper? And then once the real table comes in, then I, you know, 
f fully upgrade. Um, but I really should invest in real chairs, ones ones with either padding or nice ergonomics that are going to be good for sitting there for m many hours. Yeah, I currently have metal folding chairs. They're not the ones that are pure metal. They do have like the thin, you know, the little bit of cushion on top of them. But really, if you're sitting there for a long period of time, that's not enough. Um, and not just from Geek Chic, but man, nice chairs are expensive everywhere. I sure. looked and now, of course, I'm also running into that issue. It's like, I kind of want to buy nicer chairs now. So even when I'm playing on the poker table, I have somewhere nice to put my booty. But so until the table from Wormwood comes, I don't necessarily want to buy wooden chairs because if they don't match, then it might look kind of weird. So I feel like I should wait until the good table comes, but that's not coming until next summer. So what it, I have a, I have one cushion that I specifically use, like when I'm solo gaming or doing anything uh, on my own that I have on one of the folding chairs. And that tends to work pretty well for my uh, my rear, but then my back still has no support basically in one of those folding chairs. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could also go with like really nice office chairs, something that, that is made to be sat in for a significant amount of time is, is really what you're going for. Uh, right. Some folks are talking about the race car style gaming chair, sort of like yours, Crystal. Yeah, I was gonna say um, that's, this is definitely, this G GT Racing yep. is the brand of a uh, computer chair that I have. And, and Yami no Senshi says, don't knock the race car gaming chair. Uh, they're amazing. Yeah, this I bought this for myself right at the beginning of the pandemic when I found out that I was going to be working from home. Um, I knew that I would be sitting in front of my personal computer more often than I ever had been really in recent times. Um, I do have another office chair somewhere. I don't remember where <laughs> it's here somewhere. Um that was my old office chair. Um, and I guess I could actually pull that up to the, the poker table. And I think that would probably work. The It's got um, armrests that might make it a little difficult to pull up clothes, but that's not actually a bad idea. And then in theory, I could put the cushion on one of the other folding chairs and at least have two seats that were not horrible yep. for now. Uh, or I could just buy a really fancy Lazy Boy recliner and put it right next to the game table and just lay around while playing games. Uh, I, I've i got a couple <laughs> of nice office chairs for, you know, in front of the computer and inside the booth. Um, but I'm I'm considering replacing them because these are noisy. Like, mm. you, you don't really think about how much noise <laughs> a chair makes until you have to be totally silent in front of a microphone. And and even just, like, I'll be in the middle of talking, and I'll just sort of lean into the mic for emphasis. Like, I'm in the middle of the scene, and it makes the chair go, click, 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 click. And I'm like, I, I got to, okay, we got to do that again. And I got to get back into the scene and restart. Yeah. And um, So I may be replacing what's in the booth with something that's maybe more solid and not going to uh, make noise. And so maybe I can start shuffling the nice office chairs in front of the gaming table. Yeah, this this one, like I said, I just bought it in March. And it like, yeah, it makes those leathery, squeaky. Yeah. Yeah, which you don't think too much about until you... Right, like it doesn't yeah. really matter. And yeah, unless I'm recording an episode of the podcast and then all of a sudden, you know, it's making fart noises and you're like, that wasn't me, I swear, it was the chair. And everybody's like, uh-huh, sure, it was the chair. <laughs> uh, Shadowling talks about power I, I i'm assuming as one of the um features in the gaming table did you get a some sort of power supply usb plugs or speakers in the the table you ordered i don't oh did i add on a power pack i don't remember uh well they haven't opened the pledge manager yet so i basically oh, they could they be an had add -on. A cool, yes so it's definitely an add-on if i do it and i went ahead and backed for so i they had a tool on their website that let you kind of design your table and figure out what the amount you would need to pay would be. And you could back for just $300 and then pay the rest later. But I went ahead and backed for the amount I believed I needed to pay. And I don't remember whether that included a power pack or not, but I could still add that on. Um, I did actually have that on my list that like for a game room in general, having places for people to charge their phones or having a speaker nearby that you could theoretically play music or some other thing from, I, I mean, if you're playing one of the, you know, unlock 
games or whatever yeah. with an app, it's nice to be able to not have to have everybody crowded around your phone on the table to listen to things. If you can pump it through a Bluetooth speaker, then, you know, it could be a better experience, theoretically. Yes. I haven't really thought about, like, other stuff. I know um, my wife has nixed the, the drink fridge. I know some people like to have a, a small snack or drink fridge in the room. Um, I, I'll just take a little walk to the, the kitchen <laughs> across the house. Um but but something like a, a speaker or I know I don't want a TV in there. Um, I don't, you know, if we are going to have any food or drinks, they're going to be on small tables or cup holders, not on the gaming surface. Um, I don't know what other extras I would want to add to the room. Does anything else come to mind, Crystal? Not really. Yeah, like I like you said, side tables are nice, even if you just get little like uh, TV tray style folding little tables to put around uh, near people, especially if you don't want drinks on the table. Because even if a table has cup holders, some beverages are not always good to put on the table, depending on the style of glass and the style of drink. Um, I've definitely had things spilled onto my poker table before, which honestly, that's another benefit of the poker table, though, is that felt cleans off real easily. Nice. Um, so yeah, like you can, it's, it's seen some rough days and honestly, it doesn't look much worse for the wear. <laughs> uh, well, I think that's, that covers just about everything. I don't know if we made any decisions. Um, I, I saw enough support for the best, uh, that I think, I think my shelf decision is, is made. I think that makes sense. Uh, someone I, did ask yeah. about the cost of the Besta. It is slightly more expensive than the Calyx, um, because you have to buy them in two foot chunks. Um, so, and the shelves you have to buy separately. So you, you sort of buy the frame and then buy the number of shelves you want. Whereas the Calyx is blocks, Plug and you play. know, here you yeah. go, <laughs> you assemble this and, and you're already set. And it's, it's got plenty of support. I understand the Calyx is great. I just think it, the best of fits a little bit better, but it is going to be the more expensive option, um, of, of what I've been looking at. And now I'm I'm kind of thinking maybe I should look at the Besta and see, especially because they're both IKEA. I imagine they wouldn't aesthetically necessarily clash with one another. No, you can get them, and I think the same finishes. I think okay. uh, all three come in the white, black, or whatever their wood, their faux wood finish is. Um, and I'm I'm actually looking at the faux wood finish because this room has wood floors. Um, okay. And so I I think that would work better than than the black. Um, Whereas, like, you know, black calyx seems to be the way to go. My wife actually has a 5x5 five five for yarn storage. Um, apparently, there's a bin that you could, that fits right into those those cells. And so we can organize Yeah, they actually the have a bunch of way. accessories. They have bins. They have doors. They have some other... They have a, a square or a, a cross thing that I think it's intended for, like, wine bottles, but would work well, theoretically, to help sort smaller games... Um, I've never bought any of the accessories, but I should look into those as well. Uh, Tracy mentions good curtains for that big window, which is probably a good idea. Um, the it will the the game wall will be near, at least on one side, near that window. So we'll probably want to have some sort of sun shading so that we don't get too much fading going on. Um, yeah. Oh, and and black calyx is sold out everywhere. Says. Oh. says Yami no Senshi. Uh, yes, I did I did see that. Um, that one is a difficult one to get right now. Well, then maybe if the best is available, maybe that'll help make the decision for me when I do decide to get some more shelves. It, it looks like it is currently in stock at our New Haven IKEA here in Connecticut. So All right. Well, if it's in stock in New Haven, then... <laughs> but do they have 10 of them is really the question. That That is a good question. <laughs> All right, I think I think that's a topic. Do we want to do any questions or answers, or or have we just worn out our welcome, Crystal? Um. Well, I will say we could. We'll maybe give it like two or three minutes if anyone has any pressing matters that they want to discuss <laughs> with Eric or I, like asking how Discovery season three is going. For if example, maybe someone wanted <laughs> to ask that question. Uh, that last episode, which is what the <sighs> third. The third. The third episode. Oh my gosh, Eric. Especially considering your, your recent name change, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Um, it I... was excellent. It was really so, a good episode. And, and I'm so, so far very happy with, um, with season, season three. three. Yeah, has just been really, really neat. Um, ooh, Coralou, that is a really good question. And 
I'm going to say something that I don't believe has been publicly announced yet. So hopefully it's okay that I'm going to say it. Um, I am actually hosting the BGG at home main stage. Um, I, yeah, I know I got asked, um, for, uh, CGE, uh, on Friday there, they have a slot from, I believe, uh, four to 8 PM central time. Um, and I'm hosting that for them. And that has not been announced. So if I wasn't supposed to say that, don't anybody tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's very exciting. I'm honestly really, really excited about it. So I'm going to be um, hosting that block and showing off some stuff and also showing videos from other people with CGE. Um, it's kind of my first gig of that nature. Uh, most of my live content has been driven by me in the past. So that's really exciting. Um, and then... Uh, also, this weekend, not related to BGG at home, um, I'm actually taking part in a brand new collaboration between people who stream on Twitch. Um, the Brothers Murph and Ruel Gaviola have put together a group of streamers. We are doing an all-day streaming event on Twitch. It's 12 hours long. Each streamer will be on for two hours. So starting at... 9 a.m. Pacific time, so noon Eastern on Saturday, um, you will be able to watch 12 hours of board game content on Twitch. And every two hours, it'll be a new channel and a new host, but we're going to raid into each stream. So you'll get to, if you start with one, it'll just move you from one stream to the next. And I am hosting the 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. slot. Again, that is Pacific time. Um, I'm going to be playing uh, the second half of the Choose Your Own Adventure board game that I started in August and still haven't finished. So, Is this the first um, or the second one? The first one, okay. The House of Danger. Yep. Um, and I intended to get right back to it, but then uh, buying the house and moving and all of that stuff happened, and all of a sudden it's November. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And yeah, that's happening on Twitch. Um, basically, if you go to the Twitter accounts of... Uh, any of the people involved, and there are a lot, uh, Paula Deming and Matthew Jude are streaming, the Brothers Murph, Ruel, me, uh, Ross from uh, More Games, please. I know I'm missing somebody. I'm not sure who. I think I'm missing someone. But regardless, that's going to be a lot of fun, and that's on Saturday this week. And then my BGG at home thing is next Friday. Awesome. Yeah. I'm keeping busy, which is kind of neat. I Someday I will have some free time and can do fun things like that. I mean, I, I, I was just like you, uh, literally a month ago. So, <laughs> you know, I get it. It's Yeah, the move kind of takes up all of the bandwidth. <laughs> I will be in full panic this weekend, I think, is, is where I will be. But that's, all right. you know, that's how it goes. Well, I haven't seen any other questions pop up in the chat, so um, we will start to wrap things up. But before you all leave, please uh, do me a quick favor and make sure you click the thumbs up button below the video. I see 18 people have already done that, which is awesome. Um, so uh, that helps with the YouTube algorithms and it lets people know that this is a video they may enjoy. And hopefully those people can come join us live in two weeks for our next episode, um, which let's see, is that the day before Thanksgiving? When is Thanksgiving? <laughs> yeah, it's the day before Thanksgiving. All right. Well, uh, so yes, uh, November 25th, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern will be our next episode. Um, we'll be maybe sharing we'll stuffing about... recipes. Yes, we'll do something thanksgiving -y maybe. Um, or I'll just call Eric a turkey. I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> what? You think I'm joking, but it would be the first time. Turkey. No, you haven't called me a turkey before. Oh, I, was like, I, I was have been call called a turkey. turkey. For a long time, there was a beanie baby turkey, and my wife had this running joke that I that it reminded her of me. Like, she'd be looking at this stuffed turkey, beanie baby, and she'd be like, yeah, it looks like you. I'm like, that looks nothing like me. It's a stuffed turkey. <laughs> and she knew that it annoyed me, so... Anyway. That is amazing. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you can join us for our next episode. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe. Wear your masks. Wash your hands. Please. Do all of the yes. stuff. Because we want to get back to board game conventions soon. So um, thank you all for joining us this evening. And until our next episode, I am Crystal Dax. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been watching Dice Tower tonight. Thank you for watching. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. Crystal and I will see you in two weeks for another installment, and I'll be in my new studio space. 
Our show is supported by viewers like you. Thank you. Dice Tower Tonight is produced by Crystal and me with assistance from Tom Vassell, Mike Delisio, Roy Canaday, and Rob Searing. That time those falling ice chunks concealed Reiner Canizia's classic auction game brought to you by Hail Hyde Ra. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. Give us your feedback on the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek, on Facebook or Twitter, or by emailing us at Crystal at DiceTower.com or Eric at DiceTower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network. Find something new at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all of us at the Dice Tower, have, have fun, fun gaming! gaming. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, Nick, the reason I ask for likes is because sometimes content on the Dice Tower that is hosted by women gets more uh, thumbs downs than other content. And so I like to preemptively balance that out. And honestly, it, it's good for my self-esteem. My top 100 has been getting thumbs downs, too. So, oh, I mean, you know. how dare us have fun and be quirky people, Eric? How dare? <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. everybody.